From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. The Biden administration rolls out new tailpipe emission standards for cars and trucks that amount to a mandate to make and sell electric vehicles. It's a de facto phase out of new gas powered cars and trucks. Whether or not you want to buy those cars and trucks, the proposal will essentially remake the U.S. auto industry if it goes forward, and it promises to become a major fault line in the 2024 presidential campaign. Welcome. I'm Paul Gigo with the Wall Street Journal Opinion Pages, and I'm here with my colleagues Alicia Finley and Kim Strassel. So tailpipe emission standards, uh, Alicia, Kim, not exactly the stuff typically of gripping political import, but in this case, it really is because uh, this is a big deal. And the Biden administration has uh, finalized its rule. And in case you thought the Biden administration was slowing down on its plans to eliminate fossil fuels, this week showed again that it is moving full speed ahead. Let's listen to Michael Regan, EPA administrator for the administration, put his gloss on the new rule. Whether it's battery electric, plug-in hybrid, advanced hybrid, or cleaner gasoline vehicles, we understand that consumer choice is paramount. And the timing could not be more perfect. New technologies have been advancing rapidly. Battery costs are declining. Consumer interest in EVs is increasing. And industry is investing heavily in the cars of the future. And EPA is not just supporting this momentum. We are providing regulatory certainty for industry innovation. And if history is any indication, we know that strong standards can and will be achieved through American manufacturing and with good paying American jobs. All right. Consumer choice paramount. Battery costs falling. Consumer uh, pickup rising. Alicia, what do you make of the uh, the administrator's uh, statements? So there's a lot to unpack here. For one, EVs only make up about or less than 8% of the consumer market right now, and 60% of those are Teslas. So what this new rule would do, uh, it is a de facto EV mandate, despite the administration's trying to convince people otherwise. Uh, it would increase uh, the greenhouse gas emissions standard for new cars and trucks from 2027 to 2032. And there'd be a somewhat slower ramp up in the first several years than what it had proposed last spring. But by 2032, 70% of sales de facto must be either EVs or plug-in EVs, which are essentially plug-in hybrids. So only 30% of cars would even potentially be regular hybrids or internal combustion engine cars. So just so we to underscore this point, there'll be choice, but it'll be a really limited choice. That's exactly right. Instead of mandating consumers buy EVs, which they, by the way, don't have the constitutional authority to do, they're saying, well, you won't really have any other choice because that's all that's going to be available. It's pretty uh, remarkable. So uh, just to follow up on here, but the Biden administration says, look at all the things we've done for the car makers and they're on board. Why They, they support this. So why are they on board? Oh, they've been taken hostage. I mean, essentially, they've been given these mandates. They've been told, we're going to give you a lot of money. You can either take all the money we give you and say that you're in favor of this, or we can make you do it anyway, and we won't give you any money. That's not much of a choice either. <laughs> so they have taken up the decision to grab the cheerleaders' pom-poms and suggest this is going to work. And I actually find this a little bit despicable in that if anybody should know how failing a prospect this is, it ought to be the U.S. automakers. Last year, Ford had an operating loss of $4.7 billion on its EV unit. That was a loss of $63,731 per EV. GM had a $2.5 billion loss just this week. We saw the CEO of Hertz 
stepped down after what was described as an electric car horror show within that rental outfit. Because he committed the company to buy all these EVs that uh, that the renters don't want. Nobody would buy. This happened to me, <laughs> by the way. I went to rent a car um, on a trip and they were like, here's your EV. I was like, don't give me that key. I will not drive that under any circumstances. <laughs> so, you know, this was happening everywhere. And there's nothing in the industry to suggest that this is either going to work or be profitable. But right now, with the temptation of those dollars in front of their noses, the car makers are saying, fine. So is this a Faustian bargain for the car makers? I'll put it this way. I think they're actually hoping for more subsidies to keep flowing and some of these leniency on the way that the tax credits in the IRA are crafted. This is the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. It's a $7,500 tax credit. Uh, and the conditions on it is that is the parts and the battery materials must be made in the U.S. or a country with which we have free trade agreements. And the problem with this, of course, is that right now they aren't. They're mostly made in China. Most of the battery materials and most of the minerals that go into the EVs cannot meet these standards. So actually fewer and fewer cars are going to be eligible for these subsidies in years going forward. So I think the, there's going to be some, I'm sure, backroom discussions between if Biden is reelected, between the automakers and the White House about how to expand the subsidies and probably just rewrite the law so that they can qualify. Joe Manchin, the West Virginia Democrat, who was the key vote Biden needed to pass the Inflation Reduction Act, has been shouting from the rooftops that the administration has already been expanding the terms for which you can get the subsidies. And he wants them limited to the, the U.S. terms that he said he signed up for in that bill. But the pressure is enormous from the auto companies to uh, wink, wink and, and broaden them. And uh, you have to assume that if Biden is reelected, that pressure will ramp up even more and he'll probably make some accommodation there. Kim, what about the lessons here, if there are any, from uh, other countries? Because we've seen the European, particularly the German EV market, really under pressure from uh, imports from China to the point where they're now saying, well, we better put tariffs on that. And uh, you've seen the take-up rate uh, uh, in the U.S. and all these countries just isn't what the politicians had promised and hoped for because, you know, consumers just really aren't all that thrilled with uh, EVs. Now, I don't have anything against EVs. If they're a terrific product, wonderful. People want to buy them, wonderful. What I disagree with from a point of view of public policy is the huge subsidies that are being shoved, but the taxpayer subsidies to, to pay for them, to help sell them. And then all these rules, which limit your choice. So if you want to buy, you know, why can't we just buy the car that we want? Yeah, I'm with you, by the way. I don't have anything against them either. And indeed, for certain people in certain situations, they may well be the very best type of vehicle they could purchase. But that's actually a very small proportion of people. And in fact, here's what we're seeing. There was a lot of talk last year about the fact that EV sales were higher last year than they had ever been. Yay. But they plateaued in the fourth quarter. And what we're seeing in the United States, which is following the example, as you note, of European countries, is that there's a certain initial take up audience. And these folks tend to be more affluent. They tend to live in nice weather states, places where EV batteries work at optimum fashion. And those are states like California, Florida, Texas, to a certain degree. They tend to be second cars, not your primary car ownership, and very urbanized. Okay, those people have now bought their EVs. And as Alicia said, it's about 8% of the nation. Everybody else, they are unaffordable. They're not what folks want. They're not what folks need or require to get around longer distances or who live in colder temperatures. You know, some of the lowest take up of EVs in the country are states that are located in the northern geography of the United States because EVs, as we saw in Chicago, do not work in cold weather. And it's mesmerizing to me that the administration has no answer for the technological question of how you fix any of that. Instead, they're just saying, we're going to demand you do this. And it's going to cause massive havoc and meltdown at some point in the automotive market. Well, their answer is technology is moving fast. <laughs> 